Hello, so good afternoon, everyone. Thank you and welcome to our virtual event on Attract and Retain Talent Building the Future Ready Construction Team. I'm Dominic. I'm delighted to be facilitating this today. Unfortunately, we are having a few technical difficulties with a couple of our panellists joining, so do bear with us. But I'd like to begin by sharing that this panel is being run as a direct request from the industry response into our market survey that we conducted a few months ago. As many of you are aware, the UK construction industry has struggled with labour and productivity for years. This issue is compounded by the question of Brexit and how to attract construction and, and how attractive construction is now seen by our younger generations. However, we believe that today's panel discussion will provide valuable insights and tips from the experts that we have on building an attractive team and retaining competent staff. So without further ado, I'd like to jump into introducing the panel now. So we'll start off and we have Alex. Good afternoon, Alex, how are you today? Oh, yeah, very well, thank you. Alex Dean is the director from Be More Effective. Also joined at the moment with, by Tristan Parsons, who's the director for the ATW Group. Good afternoon, Tristan. Good afternoon, Dom. Lovely. Um, I think we are having a few problems with Rosalind joining and um, Andy. So hopefully they'll be able to join us a bit later. Yeah. Rosalind Thorpe is the director of education standards from the CIOB. And Andy is the director, a director from Keyline, who is in charge of their leap apprenticeships and early careers. So let's go on with the first question now. What are the challenges you foresee in attracting and retaining talent in the construction industry in the near future, Andy? Um, at the moment, one of the big things that's going around at the moment is minimum wage, obviously, is going to go up. April, that's going to put a huge factor on not only the bottom line increasing things up but keeping those gaps throughout the throughout the, the levels of the workforce for example minimum wage is going to be twenty one and a half thousand pounds for a 40-hour job um in april from april onwards um and then it's obviously keeping the training experience staff in the workforce in a very short space of time we're going to have a very strong workforce in the industry as far as qualifications go but there's going to be a shortage of that physical experience um and it's how we develop this we're using the skills that we've got there at the moment to develop and bring through the qualified people to have the physical on the job experience as well. It's going to be a massive challenge. That's wonderful. Thanks very much, Alex. Just leading on from that, um, if I'm leading a team of, say, technical managers or architects and I'm struggling with growing, how can I assess and improve how I attract and retain talent that I need? Attraction and retention are very different things. Um, attraction, obviously, bringing new people in, retention, retaining who you've already got in the business. The attraction itself, you need a job description, you need an advert, but you need two, very, they're very different things. Um, write your job description, go through the whole process of exactly what are we looking for. Build that job description, it can be five, six, seven pages long. Build the advert as a result of that job description. Use that to be your short, snappy, like, this is who we are, this is what we're offering. Um, and use that to, to entice people in. It's not just about the monetary side of it. Obviously, there is a financial aspect to all of that, but there's the that's the obvious stuff. Um, look at things like meeting the team. Do they gel with, can we get them to business? Can we get them to spend time with the people they're gonna be working with? Do they gel? Things like that is gonna attract and show the opportunity within the business. Then you go on to retaining them, show the growth, show the future, show the opportunity to keep them. Um, a good advert will, will also show that, but that retention from once they're already in the business. Um, you've got things like EAP, so employee assistance programs. Um, they'll help you with retention as well. Things like perk box is one of them. They actually show 36% um, less absences in businesses that have got EAPs in place. Things like that are, are a huge factor in retaining your staff. Some brilliant insightful thoughts there. Thank you very much, Alex. I see Rosalind has joined us now. Hi, Rosalind, how are you this afternoon? Yes, I'm fine, thank you. And I do apologise, I had some problems getting in. That's not a problem at all. Okay, so I'm just going to start off and fire a question at you now, Rosalind. So, why is the industry struggling to recruit and retain competent people? Yeah, I, I think part of that is about the image of the industry. So um, we don't have a high profile in terms of some of the more uh, interesting things we do. Uh, general to the general public, they see us as, you know, they they get exposure to 
little domestic projects and they think, well, that looks really like a horrible job, <laughs> you know, and they don't see the more the bigger and more exciting things that we do, the hospital projects, the, you know, strategic uh, infrastructure projects. And um, so th there is a problem that they, that's not seen because it's behind boardings most of the time. And what is seen is is a man on a roof with no um, no harness and no even no hat, <laughs> you know. So that that's a problem. Um, so it's somehow or another we do need to present uh, a better image of our industry. Uh, you, you know, to give a really defined, clear image of it. Some of it is the business model, which is quite cyclical and exposed to ec economic downturns. So, you know, uh, companies do go bankrupt quite often and people get made redundant. We lost a lot of people in the last rece recession. Over 400,000 people left our industry in the last recession. So, of course, we're going to have um, difficulties recruiting and retaining with, with that on our shoulders. Um, and I think sometimes it, it's the working hours and the conditions that are, are a problem. So we do need to be more modern in how we um, how we deal with our people, how we uh, our working conditions for people. So, um, you know, it, it's we have the highest levels of poor mental health and suicides um, compared to other industries. So we we probably need to adopt more flexible working um, patterns. Uh, there is a lovely um, uh, kind of um, research project going on with TimeWise, looking at how we can introduce more flexible working, not just for off-site staff, but for on-site staff as well. So I think some of those things can be addressed quite easily, but some of them are more entrenched in the business model, which is um, reliant on casual labor a lot of the time. And, you know, that casual labor is not secure work. So um, somehow we need to tackle that too. That's lovely, thank you very much. I'm just gonna move over to Tristan now with a question we have here. What strategy, strategies have you found in retaining top talent in the construction industry? especially new niche, niche skill sets um, where I may be competing heavily with others on. Yeah, thank, thanks, Dom. Um, it's an interesting question and I have a little bit of experience from being an employer in this, in this space over the last 20 years or so. Um, ultimately, it comes down to culture, um, which is kind of a bit of a fluffy word, but kind of a little sentence that kind of sums it up is really the way we do things around here and it's pretty pretty important um very important and uh, it's a lot of how we sort of live and breathe in our in our organizations um that make that makes them unique so that people can see there's a difference with a company um and that's attractive to them some of the ways that plays out so one factor that we found that attracts and retain people is growth and vision um, if you've got a clear vision in your company and you've set out, this is where we want to get to in the future. So a mission statement is not exactly time bound, but we want to be like in the case of Sapphire, the balcony of choice globally. It's kind of an aspirational long term vision, but then a more specific one for like in three years time, we see that we could get to this this level of growth um, and keeping doing new things. So that being being part of a progressive organisation that is growing and moving forward. I find that with good people, great talent, want to be part of something that's growing and winning. Everybody likes to win. Um, and leading on to our second point, as well as being part of a, a growing and visionary company that's got a clear future, um, is the opportunities for people to take on new responsibilities. Um, personally, I'm not a great fan of having sort of career progressions mapped out. I've never really done that with people that we've recruited. The way I tend to say it is we don't know what opportunity is going to come up. This business is constantly moving. We're not standing still. All I can say is that definitely some great opportunities are going to come up and the best people um, that are in the right place at the right time will have those opportunities to step up. And I find that more inspiring for people than necessarily knowing I'm always going to progress in this set method. 
and to see colleagues that have been able to step up through and, and cross training is a pretty important thing. We probably don't do enough of it, but somebody that's moved from one department into a completely different department actually strengthens the organization because when you come new into a department, you kind of say, why on earth do we do it this way? And they're just like, um, yeah, I don't know quite. We've just always done it that way. So you actually strengthen your own thing by flushing those sort of things out. So personally, that's what I kind of do, not having the grip after giving people opportunities by progressing the company and constantly trying new things, even if there's a bit of uncertainty around them. Um, thirdly, this one's probably a bit of a contentious one in the construction industry, but personally, I'm a big fan of the remote working and flexible working. Um, I think certainly in one of our newer businesses that we started three or four years ago, the MyDeck business, I think probably half of our staff would, would leave effectively if we kind of took away that. We started before the pandemic with providing remote work. And if you want to make that work, there's ways. Um, rather than just say, we did this before and it worked well when we were all together and now we're kind of remote, it's a bit difficult. We can't see what people are doing. We kind of wonder how hard they're working. If you actually want to make it work and a bit creative about it, uh, we did a survey of, of our people and said, what do you see as the advantages of being in the office? What do you see as the advantages of being remote? And we're trying to get the best of both worlds and say, okay, so we can't do, so if we're remote, we can't do certain benefits, but what other ways could we achieve the similar benefits? So a lot of our people are spread over quite a big area, but we kind of do in that particular business, what we call a together day. Um, so once a month, people will travel, even if it's quite a long travel and get together, we just hire a bit of space and it will all get together. And that kind of helps foster that bit of being together while, while being apart. Um, that's probably enough for me, various other points I could go into, but they're, they're three that I think might be helpful. I think you kind of touched on it there with the remote working. I think since COVID, people have realised that remote working actually suits some people. It gives them more flexibility with their families as well. Um, so I think that's become a very key thing. I think before COVID, I think people were very nervous about allowing their staff to work from home, whether they get the, the same sort of productivity. And I think when COVID hit and it forced companies to actually do it and, and move into that way of working to continue their business, I think it really showed that, you know, pe people do want to work, people do want to be proactive and actually put the best they can in. And, and some people find it very comfortable just to work from home as well. So it's makes very taste to uh, yeah, it's a, within the workforce now as a whole, there's an expectation that it's an opportunity that's there. Um, as we say, COVID moved things forward. We were talking about it earlier. COVID's moved things forward, and there's that expectation that we need to be offering people the flexibility. It's almost irrelevant what we want from a candidate. We're in a candidate market at the moment. Yeah. Employers can't make, uh, lay down all the rules. We have to be a bit flexible to what candidates want and expect from us as well. Agreed completely. And in construction, it's obviously harder with people kind of out and about in different, in different locations, not always sat at home. Um, but we have the same with like Salesforce that are out and about traveling. One of the key things that we do across the business, whether you're in the office or out of the office or remote, is the daily huddle. Um, so there can be a different amount of people in a team, but that very much fosters that team, team relationship that you're not on your own. There's a, hum, a human connection. And we have up to... 15 people on some of those huddles, but they're, they're very brief. And whether you're out on the road, sitting in your car on the side of a side of a road or out, out on a site, or you're sat in your home office or you're in the office together with other people, even when there's multiple people in the office, we just, they get joined from individual screens. So you're all the same. Um, and in that huddle, you know, one of the ones I'm mainly involved in, we just do three things for each person. What's the positivity? So what's a bit of good news, either personal or something good that happened at work yesterday? Uh, what's your main focus for today and is there anything you're stuck on and that can be done pretty fast paced in like 30 seconds per person um, but it brings out some good stuff if somebody's stuck and somebody else said oh no, no you can we can help you on that or i'll stay on for a few minutes after the meeting finishes mm -hmm. that's really good at connecting people wherever they are and yeah. i think that's better than for people dotted around remotely and it's harder than in an office when you kind of have to everyone walk to the same place Indeed, and, and to be fair, I, I think that also makes everyone feel very included and very in inclusive in what they're doing. So, so you do still feel a team, even if you're not actually sat around with each other as a team. So, you also get from that aspect as well. There's a people people need and what people want from the environment to get the best versions of them. You'll find people if you put people in one room and say, "Get running coach, talk." They won't have the confidence to do it. You need they 
sometimes being on Zoom teams, being at that little bit of distance gives people the, the confidence and the, the ability to open up and then share those things, whereas they're just going to their shelf and put them in that environment where everyone's set around together, almost stage fright, if you, if you like, for use of another word. And the other thing, linking that with retaining people, we've had some good staff who, for obviously personal reasons, have had to move overseas. I know one of our SAFI people moved to the States and one of our Mardic people moved to Mozambique, I think it was, and we've been able to recruit some people from like the Philippines to do certain jobs. And with this remote and Zoom, they, they're, they're joining those daily huddles just as if they were sat you know, in the next desk to you. So that is actually getting that's talent from wherever it is in the country or in the world to be part of your team. And that's very powerful. It's the flexibility. You're looking for the skill set. It's almost, it's almost irrelevant where that person is. Over technology in this day and age, that if you get the right skill set and have the willingness and the desire to be flexible, you can, you can bring them into a business. Indeed. And a similar kind of comment around that, about attracting um, and retaining top talent. We kind of have two recruitment tracks where you either find a good person and shape a role to suit that person, which I'm very much a fan of, uh, versus the side of, we've got a job role, here's the pigeonhole, here's exactly what it looks like, let's try and find someone that fits into that pigeonhole, um, which is the kind of job description route. But I'm quite a fan of if you're recruiting for a certain role, and you find someone you think is good, but they don't fit that role, why not kind of, you know, very much a fan and believer in the kind of personality profiling stuff. And the one that I find most valuable is the one done by Gallup, and it's called the Clifton Strengths model. And then actually building role and saying, actually, we haven't got a role, but actually you could be really useful in this team and actually do a bit with that team. And we find that's really powerful that person thinks, actually, you've understood me as a person and you're helping me spot what I'm good at. That's a really positive framing that Gallup thing it's all mm -hmm. you go through your life being told oh you're not very good at this you need to improve at that this is kind of taking it the other way saying this is your unique set of strengths and that's very attractive to people and that goes back to the retention again and the, you're valuing the people that you're showing you're highlighting to them the value and making them feel important for the skills that they've got and that's a massive part of retention if people feel like they're valued by a business rather than just a number or in to do a specific job they, they will stay you will keep hold of the staff and the strengths and the skills within your team for longer so just moving on from that slightly, Tristan, you're talking about how flexible Sapphire are and, and the ATW group as a whole. And um, just a particular question, I understand that the ATW group has a very high NPS score and staff retention rates. How important are they and do construction companies achieve similar to this? Um, I can't speak for other companies, but in terms of the four companies in our, in our group, um, yes, correct. We have a NPS score of 70 roughly, um, which is, I believe, sort of world-class. That's, for those that don't know what an NPS score is, you're asking 100% of your people, um, would you recommend ATW as a place to work on a scale of one to 10? And only, only a nine or 10 count as somebody who's really passionate about the company. And that means kind of at least 70% of people or it's the number of people that scored a nine and 10 versus anybody that scored a one to six, which will typically get some. So we've got a 70% score, which is very high. Um, one of the reasons we do that is continually focusing on it. So once in a while, probably once every six months, maybe 12 months, you survey the whole staff at one go. But in between that, we pick, say, a quarter of the people or a fifth of the people every month and ask a few people each month. Um, hello, Andy. Welcome to join. We're just talking about NPS score. And the key thing is acting on this. I'm not a believer in anonymous feedback. Some, some of these people, some of these programs say people are freer to say what they really think if it's anonymous. To me, that kind of is a sign of suboptimal culture. I'd far rather people be free to say what they think and they're respected for that. And, yeah. you know, if they've got a counter view, that's a good thing. You've got a fear. If you've got people that when you're doing anonymous, non, anonymously, you've got a fear within the business, and that's not what you want. That's not the culture people are looking for to, to retain and keep staff in the first place anyway. Kind of a key point in what we were saying earlier is about recruiting and retaining. Whatever it is, if it's a change in, change in your life, a really key motivator is fear, fear of the unknown of things. And the more your culture can remove that fear and people to see that they're respected and they can say what they really think. So with that, you sort of say, what, what, how would you score out of one to ten? And then there's just that one question: what could you do? What, what could you do to improve your score, or what could we do better? Constantly listening on that, 
um, it gets that score up over time. And if there's somebody that's scoring six or below, yeah, more than once or twice, three times, clearly they're not really suiting the culture. They're not really enjoying it. And the fact of helping with them and discussing that openly with them and saying that do you think it'd be better off in the business where, say, there's not quite the same work ethic, for example, um, and then moving out of the business makes it even more attractive for those that are all of a similar culture and fit it. Perfect. Hi, Andy. Thank you for joining us. I was, um, I'm so late, I apologise for being late, and, and it was quite ironic because I joined just as you guys were talking about how we could do everything with Zoom nowadays, but people joining from different parts of the world, and I'm thinking, I'm only sat in bloody Birmingham and I can't get Zoom at work, but that's, um, that's a, a little bit ironic, I guess, in terms of, uh, in terms of technology. So Andy, you're from Keyline, aren't you? Uh, the Travis Perkins Group, so um, Keyline's one of, our, one of our businesses, so yeah, but I look after um, pretty much skills and, and apprenticeships and that sort of type of activity across the, across the group. Obviously, I came from Keyline before I joined Sapphire, so I, I know very much about your apprenticeship programme and, and what you do there and how you try and breed your staff and, and mould them to make them a better person and work them within the group. Yeah, I think that one of the things in terms of retention and, and keeping hold of colleagues, one of the things that's really important to understand about apprenticeships. So, yeah, most of us think of apprenticeships as young kids out of school. You know, go and buy the tartan paint and, and, and sweep the floor and make a cup of coffee. And, and you know, maybe sort of 30, 40 years ago, there was some there was some truth in how apprenticeships were. But, but apprenticeships, apprenticeships are transformed nowadays. Uh, the apprenticeship reforms, which came into play in 2016, the introduction of the apprenticeship levy really changed that. So we have we still use apprenticeships for, for entry level recruitment of, of kind of you know people from other sectors or people that have education into into the business. And we've got about seven or eight hundred apprentices who come to us for that route every year. But we massively use apprenticeship for development in the current population. So people are already in, in in roles and situations. And if you think about the changes that we're all facing into with, you know, modern methods of construction, retrofit agenda, all the things we're having to deal with, you know, there's a lot of skills and a lot of training needed. And we use apprenticeships to, to upskill people in those areas who are already in the business. And from a retention point of view, you know, it's, it's quite fascinating. So as soon as we put somebody on an apprenticeship who's already working for us, if you look at the, the stats, that that, that that chance of leaving half almost overnight. So so we retain a lot more people by giving them the development, the training that they need to to um yeah to deal in the modern world. And in reality, is giving them a formal qualification in that, which is what an apprenticeship is uh, is nowadays. It yeah, makes a massive difference. So that's very much my world. Yes. So just going back to an earlier question, you're probably very well placed to answer it. What are the challenges you foresee within um, attracting and retaining talent within the construction industry within the near future? Well, we, we have to understand, don't we, that, that you know, the reality is that we're an ageing workforce, it's an ageing population, we're all getting older. Um, I've been doing this since I was a kid, since I left school at 16, and I'm, I'm not by any means unique in that. And, and the reality is we don't have the number of young people joining the sector that, that, that we need. So, yeah, if you look at the CITB stats, I think they talk about 45,000 additional people needed every year, and we're getting something like 15,000 joining the sector. So, so the reality is, you know, those experienced people have already got within the sector are going to get more and more rarer and harder and harder to um, to get hold of as 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 time goes on, unless we do something about it. So so, you know, if you think it's tough to recruit people today, do you know what? It just gets tougher every year that goes by. I think we see I think the numbers are about 25,000 retire out of the construction sector every year, two and a half million people work in construction. So every 25,000 that retire are replaced by about five or 10,000 people joining the sector. So it gets tougher and tougher. So the, the the challenge is we have to do something about that and we need to get on with it. And the answer from, from our perspective is about training people, either young people education settings or people who are career switching. There's a lot of opportunities in that at this moment in time with the, the change we've seen driven by digital. It's about bringing them into the, the sector. Apprenticeships are the are the obvious route to do that because the government pay you to do it. So that that's quite useful, but you don't have to pay for the training. Um, but but as a as a construction sector, you know, I work in construction supply. We're, we're, we're not great at it. Construction sector aren't great at it. We're just not developing enough people to, to deal with that kind of people topping off the, the top and retiring. We, we have to address that need and we have to address it quickly. If not, the whole ability to attract and retain just gets tougher and tougher and tougher. You know, wage rates escalate and escalate and escalate as, as the war for talent just gets harder for, for all of us unless we bring more people in. Perfect. You, you touched on about 25,000 people leaving the industry every year. I think one of the main major problems with that is the 25,000 that are leaving, they don't seem to be imparting their skills on the 5,000 that are joining. So 
there's there's a massive gap as well within the actual skills that are coming back into the industry. Yeah, and, and it's twenty five thousand retiring. So if you look at those leaving, it's an even bigger number. So those are just the ones who, who take the pension and 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 kind of walk away. So. So the, the the number of people leaving, I think, is, is about double that, or might be slightly more. So, um, so yes, yeah, a big issue. And, and and you're right. The, the, the irony is that we've got a lot of people in trades who would really like to pass those skills on. You know, mm -hmm. so you get to that that time in life, don't you? When your knees are gone, your elbows are gone, and and you don't want to be on the tools quite so much. And the ability, you know, the opportunity to pass that knowledge on to other people, yeah, you know, has, has got two benefits. One, it, it gives you something to do to keep you keep you out of the cold for a while but but the, but the second opportunity is there's something really psychologically rewarding about that you know you've worked hard for 20 30 40 years to build up a a, a knowledge bank that's this that you know is, is pretty important the ability before you go off and start pushing up daisies or whatever you're going to do to, to pass that knowledge on to another generation for they can take that mantle and kind of run with it and do it i, I think you know I've, I've spoke to hundreds not thousands of people who really get that and really understand that um but what we're very poor at as a sector at the moment is designing the mechanics to enable people to do that. We don't really have the opportunities to do that are, are, are very limited. And, and I think there's, you know, certainly I, I can talk a bit about what we're doing in Travis Perkins, but there's an awful lot more we can do as a sector, which would help, for use of a better phrase, the old lags who have been around for a fair old while, pass some of those skills and knowledge on to, a, to another generation who are, who are coming into the, into the sector. It's a very good point. And although you can pass those skills on, you can't unfortunately pass your, your reputation on. So sometimes, although skills are being passed on, people are still struggling to get the work because they don't have the reputation that the, the previous person had as well. Yes, it's, a, it's an age old problem, isn't it? So the whole father and son kind of, you know, structure of, 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 of SMEs within 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 the sector is, is kind of, you know, always sort of had an element of that to it. You know, so so I think, yeah, they're, they're, it's difficult, but but there's no reason why we can't teach another generation of young people the skills and knowledge that exist today. And, and there's, there's pockets of that everywhere. I'm sure you guys see it all the time. You know, there's, I, I could bore you with a hundred stories where we've done where that's happened really successfully, but 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 not enough of it, unfortunately, to meet the the needs of the sector. Okay, so that's possibly a relevant point on that. So something that I think is certainly been massively overlooked. Um, is the value of internal training and just sharing in internal CPDs. Uh, when we talk about training, we so much sort of think of going off and doing a course the day, um, but very much thinking what you're passing on and even the father and son thing. Um, yeah, my dad's like that. He, you know, being in the business, started it and accumulated a huge wealth of knowledge that nobody else in the business has quite got. Um, but you kind of so rarely do this. And when we do a session internally, of course, it's free of charge. You're not paying a trainer or anybody. And sit down in a room with him and kind of 10 others, 20 others, whatever, and just talk about a certain subject and asking questions. Kind of when you've acquired that knowledge, you don't actually realise what knowledge you've got. Um, and actually sitting down, that makes the people feel really good that they've spent time with somebody experienced. Um, and it's actually more powerful than sort of going away on a course and hearing a generic, generic course. And that's something that any business could be could be doing, just spending that time. Yeah, you know, might only just be three quarters an hour over a lunchtime or something. And that imparting it, imparting of knowledge is, I think, severely under underrated or even not thought about by a lot of us. I can agree more with you on that point. It's I I do the, C, the CPDs for Sapphire and and the balcony design ones specifically. Yeah, I'm pretty sure the, the CPD that I would give on balcony design would be completely different to what what your dad would be in yeah for me it'd probably be very insightful to actually sit down and watch that so there's a big difference between the theory and what you actually learn from it's practical experience is what we're talking about here and then it's that practical experience which is what we're going to lack we can teach we can put people in classrooms for as much for as long as we want and we can try and develop um young people coming through and, and try and bring them into businesses but it is that practical on the job knowledge it's, it's that old analogy of learning to drive a car you learn to pass the test, then you learn to actually drive the car. Mm. And it's the same in, in, in industry, particularly in the construction industry. You're, you're looking at that physical on-the-job skill set, learning things that you will only pick up over time unless you physically, like you say, Tristan, sit down and go through it. You, that knowledge is, is going to get lost. There's no way, there's no other way of doing it than passing that knowledge on from one person to the next. And no, there's no, nothing like touching and touching and feeling something either exactly. to actually try something with your own hands. It's very easy to not understand yeah. something as a manager or what we've done with some of our teams here talking about 
in production and off-site off stuff where we're producing balconies off-site, we've got a team like, for example, our procurement team, they've kind of donned their sort of uh, work, work gear for a day and gone and had a bit of fun yeah. basically being out there assembling a balcony themselves and had a bit of a laugh and really enjoyed it and you know, got photos and that's actually an experience that come away and it allows them to empathise and understand a bit more what a different group of people are actually doing and that's actually quite powerful. And it's a safe environment for them to make a mistake and mm -hmm. learn from it. Um, if we don't put people in environments where they, where they can learn and make mistakes in, and safely, it's, it, we're never going to get that, that knowledge and that people are never going to learn from it. If we don't make mistakes, we never develop, we never upskill ourselves anyway. Sorry, Andy. I, I... No, I was just say that's that's why we're such fans of the apprenticeship route. So, so you know, apprenticeships for us is about on the job learning. So there's a little bit of theory that goes into it, but it's only a little bit of theory, and then you go put it into practice. So you get on with that. Usually working alongside someone who's experienced within within that that area. So that kind of learning that you described that, that you could do in a CPD session, or you, you're doing that all day long working as an apprentice for someone who's experienced, but getting the theoretical learning that goes with it. And what we, we so we're a large organization, so loads of it easier for us, I guess, in terms of how we set this stuff up. But we, we, we have in fact established ourselves as a training provider. So nowadays we, we train our own people. So if we're training somebody to be an HGV driver, well, the guy who's training them is an ex HGV driver for us. You know, if we're training somebody to work in, in uh, on tool hire, well, the guy who's training them is a tool hire guy who's been on, in doing tool hire for us often for 20 or 30 years, getting to that point where they want to retire, but they want to pass the knowledge and skills on to somebody else. And we find that model really effective about taking the experienced people who already work within the business, giving them a little bit of knowledge about how you pass training on, and then giving them a group of 10, 15, 20, often younger people, but not always, to, to work with over the next year or two years, giving them an apprenticeship, but bringing them up to speed on what they need to do, working alongside somebody in a local environment who's, who's been doing that job for 10 years as well. And that, that's how we're, we're passing knowledge on. We've got one and a half thousand people on those apprenticeship programs now, and it's, and it's growing, growing all the time. So, you know, it's an, it's an effective route in. I think uh, I think the thing we've realised is, is it's bloody complicated because of the government stuff and and the funding rules and all the paperwork and admin. So we're trying to talk to other people, you know, customers and various people who are in that go that we can help set all that up if that's what you want to do. So if you want to take that on board and do some of that stuff yourself, then we'll work with you to help you understand all the complex world because it's all very well us having one and a half thousand apprentices, but but. From a customer base point of view, that's not necessarily helping our customers because if there's not enough customers to to do the trades, then actually us having loads of people who can sell the product and move around the country isn't brilliant because we need more tradespeople. So we're now working quite closely with a number of customers on actually let's help you do that as well. And it's really it's really not that difficult when you get your head around it, but it does take a bit of getting your head around. Okay, thank you. Uh, so Roslyn, with the construction industry facing ongoing challenges around health and safety. What kind of training support is provided to ensure the well-being of its workers? Yeah, that's an interesting question. I obviously don't work for a construction company, but I do think culture is a big issue in our industry. And I, <clears throat> I don't want to criticise anybody here because everybody's trying to do their best, but we're all part of that culture. And we talk about father and son, and we talk about the guy who does this and the guy who does that, you know, this is not inclusive language so we've developed our own language which actually excludes people so I, I do think we need to address that and you know part of the reason for that is we're expecting tough guys to come into this industry and you know the health and safety they'll just put up with the knocks and the falls and whatever it is you know we need a more diverse industry and we need to put people's, not only their physical health, but their mental health uh, at the forefront of what they do. And I think we don't value people who are in trades roles very often because they are self-employed or contracted or from an agency and they're getting paid by the hour or whatever, and they've got to get it done by five o'clock. You know, so we don't give them a sense of pride in what they're doing, you know. Uh, we don't open our eyes and look at what how we talk about people because we are using very male dominated language and you know uh, this this means that we don't feel a good place to enter for other people for a more diverse workforce and actually this is crucial to safety you know it's it's crucial to whole life safety so that we 
have a sense of pride <clears throat> and a sense of we're building something that's safe and comfortable for people um, and a sense that um, we are valued in the workplace. So I do think our main challenge in terms of health and safety is the culture that we're all in. We need to overcome that and to develop a different mindset towards it, to value people, to say, oh, you've done a really good job there. That's amazing what a piece of bricklaying or plumbing or piping, whatever you've done, it's an amazing piece of work and you should feel a strong sense of pride in it. So I think we're an industry that lacks confidence because we've always for the past 10 years, I would say we've been chasing money and time and not thinking about people. It's essentially about people. We're creating something for people and we're using people to create that, that asset. So, you know, we should be thinking more about people. And certainly we need to develop a new language to talk <laughs> about what we do, you know, because I know many of our apprentices will be males. You know, but if we keep talking about guys and stuff, we're probably not going to uh, change that very quickly. I have to say there, there are quite a lot of initiatives within the construction industry now for women within construction. I think it's, it is very much changing. And I think people are seeing that, that the work that, that women can do is no different to what, what a male can do. Yes, there, there might be slight differences on how many bricks they can carry but that's not that's not the be all and end all it's the actual end product of, of the work and i think it is becoming very, very it uh, is but when, when we know that we've got somewhere we won't have women in construction groups because you don't get women in in media groups or women in journalism groups or you know we will know we have success when we no longer need to have women in construction groups <laughs> you know it, it's not a good sign really i i, I couldn't agree more and i think i think it's a massive opportunity isn't it in terms of when, when you, you think about attraction into the sector and attraction into the industry and, and it's a mostly you know it's a male orientated sector and most of our attraction is about males joining the joining the businesses and therefore you're only working with half the uk plc you then come on to the challenge of net zero in 2050 the challenge of you know, where we want to go with modern methods construction and different ways of building. And actually, we need different thought processes. We need different ways of approaching it. And, and, and I think you're absolutely right. The, the broadening of, of, of you know, the, the, the population that make up construction is massive. And we've all got, you know, I'm, I'm as guilty as anybody about the language. I'm, I'm terrible. I know I am. But I've been doing this since I was a 16-year-old kid. We all are. Kid. Even I yeah. am. It, it, you know, it's part of it. Uh, when I, I, someone I, says someone did something, I said, well, who is he? And they said, well, it's not a he. It's a she, actually. Yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> yes, we're all it's radical, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 And when, that, when, uh, interesting, forty percent of our apprentices are female, which which is a real breakthrough good. that we're we're starting to to uh, attract females in. But when it comes to retention, our retention yes. levels for females are lower. So yeah. we're, we're, we they're, they're keen to join and keen to come and explore and find out about the industry, but actually they don't so often often stay, unfortunately. Which is is one of the things we're trying to. You know, really work out what do you do about that, and how do we how do we make it more more attractive? Is, today? is that the culture, Andy? Is yeah. that because they're in a culture that's very male orientated, and they don't feel included in it? Yeah, with, with that, <coughs> that I speak. I speak to one of our apprentices was last year actually, but she works in a in, in a key line branch. Interestingly enough, who, who do civils, and, and and she probably though she's the only. So she'd been with this for about four months, early twenties. She's the only female employee in the branch. And she reckons about once every three weeks, she has a female customer, about once every three weeks. So, you know, so her world is, is, is entirely surrounded by a male customer base and a male workforce with the branch she's in. And actually, in her case, we did hook her up with other female apprentices in similar situations. And we got a little network going, which, which helped. But you go, that's got to be pretty tough, isn't it? You know, kind of, you know, once tough. every three weeks, I might see someone of the same, mm. the same gender to, to, you know, visit my branch. But the rest of the time, mm. it's, uh, it's all male. So yeah. big challenge back a bit to that flexibility point that we kind of majored on earlier we, yeah. we've certainly found that in our workforce that often it's the females that particularly need that flexibility of you know school trips and things like that yeah. um, and so that that's really attractive <laughs> there's, there's a huge amount of skills in those people that you know they might not be able to work such long long hours um but often they're happy to work sort of out out of hours and 
evenings and stuff like that to make up that time and that's pretty valuable talent that you're otherwise missing out on when you're just expecting that full full working day there's a there's a common theme of when a tradition within tradition within recruitment and with employment across the, across the country across the world of you're employing someone and you they got what they've got to work nine to five they've got to do these hours etc at the end of the day we're paying people with employment to do a job mm. if they're doing the job there's no reason why we can't offer them the flexibility if they're delivering what we need to they're delivering the results we want from them why are we limiting people to nine to five why are we saying you have to be at the desk and i thought you have to be at desk at 7 30 whatever that looks like there's no need to do that as long as they're delivering what we want from them and that as we say that flexibility comes into that if we give them that they opens up a whole new talent a talent pool a whole new sector of the employment market that we can then dip into and start having conversations and bring those people into the workforce i think a lot of people now are are looking on the industry as as let's be more liquid let's be more flexible because that's that's when you are going to get the best out of people so i know after what you were just saying about school and things like that my wife is is an absolute stickler for it and and her work know that there's no point calling her between half two and half three because she will be on the school run but but even on the school run, she'd, she'd be on a team school trying to sort something out. But it is it is nice to see how flexible people can be now. I think it, it does bring the best out to people as well, because you think, well, they're helping me to be able to facilitate my life and, and what I need to do. So I'm going to help them and, and put more and put more back. So but in a competitive job market, how should companies attract top talent, Alex? Everything we've just spoken about is the short answer is the flexibility the the bringing people in um it's the the correct language the culture all of these things need to be highlighted um the, the reality of it is 20 20 percent of people leave a new role within nine weeks of starting if we don't get it right in the attraction point we're only going to add to that stat and we can keep attracting people as much as we want but we won't retain and won't keep them in the business so going back to what we've just said it's the flexibility it's the culture etc um, but we're also in a candidate market. We we used to be able to, used to be able to put an advert out there and turn around and say, I'll get somebody come and apply and, and we'll be able to go, thanks very much, that's that's the job filled. Pre-COVID, we were getting kind of 60, 66% more advert, um, applicants to an advert than we are now. We were getting, only getting a third of those applicants come through. You've got to go and find these people. We're looking for the, someone to come in and for the apprenticeship for the younger younger generation to come through are we advertising in the right place social media campaigns um there's, there's no point just putting an advert on for example a job board and thinking everybody can see it now we need to be targeting people we need to be going and trying to find the people we want to bring into the industry the other side of that is are we meeting the expectations it's all well and good putting a, a job advert out there but is it in line with what the market is expecting for that specific role right now are we looking at transferable skills? Are we bringing people in that, for example, are doing an assistant role that could then step up into the role we're looking for now? Um, are we giving people these opportunities? There's there's, no, there's nothing to say that somebody couldn't be doing an assistance job now and then they're, they're ready to take that step up. They've been doing it for five or six years. Are, are we open to, to, to that skill set being moving forward? The transferable skills, can we bring people in to the, to the business that have got skills from other industries that bring them over and utilize a transferable skill set. All these things we need to put into our adverts to attract the right people. If we're just looking for, for example, um, a designer, when we're looking for somebody that's done badly design before, for example, we're in a very small market. Right? Yeah. We, we need to be able to open up to a, a, wider, a wider talent pool um, and, and utilize the skills that are around. It touches back to a couple of the points we were making earlier that um, it's suiting a role to a person rather than a person exactly. to a role. Because if you advertise for a certain role in construction, probably mainly people in that industry are going to take any notice of it. The others sort of don't, don't see it as relevant to them. Um, but what we do, I'm sure lots of other companies do it as well, where we offer existing staff like a bonus if they kind of recommend somebody else into the company. Because everyone has kind of bound to have got friends or people they know or people they've worked with in the past that are in other industries and if they recommend it coming back to the culture point and mps score if it's a great place to work a great industry to be in and they tell some friends about it um and also they're incentivized it's in their interest as well and they bring someone in and you think this is a great person actually they've got something to offer from a different industry and then you say actually i think you'd be really good at doing this and this and actually shape a role to that person 
that's how we kind of overcome that thing. And I think often these kind of limiting beliefs are in in our heads. Yeah. We sort of think there's a shortage of staff. This is a major problem. When actually there's millions of people in the country, sort of thing. It's just a case of like attracting them in. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And it's it's the other thing to bear in mind if we put in adverts and put in job descriptions together to attract people. We actually, it's very easy to go, this is amazing, this is the best job in the world, etc. Feel something, whether even when we're talking to somebody and trying to fit a role around them, we've got to stick to it. It's got to be accurate. It's got to be what we're, we need to be able to deliver what we're putting into these texts. Even if we're bringing somebody in a role we've designed saying this will be great for you, we actually need to be able to go, look, this is, we said we'd deliver, this is where we said we are. We need to stick to it. And if we're not, then we're not going to be able to attract those people in. It's as simple as that. As much as we may turn around as within the industry, within the recruitment world in general, within any industry or sector, you and say, this is what we think we should be offering, to a certain degree, it's almost irrelevant. In a candidate market, we've got to deliver what candidates want. If we don't do that, it's not going to happen. The market changes, the market switches. Unfortunately for people in my, my situation, it's never balanced. You never get candidates and employers looking for control at the same time. You never get that level playing field. It's always going to be an employer's market where you can be a little bit more, this is what we want to deliver and people are going to take it, or a candidate's market where you need to deliver what they're expecting. We have to go one way or the other. And at the moment, it's in the candidate's favour and we need to be able to, to manage that and uh, be clear with the expectations and what we deliver as a result. So as I mentioned at the very start, this whole panel today has come about from um, the response to the market survey we did a few months ago. One of the key things that kept coming up was competency as well. So we've had a question come through and it says, is competency best obtained with high job offers or is it about attitude and building competency as, as you go on? Yeah, mass, massive fan of attitude rather than qualifications, yeah. Um, I was going to make this point about creativity as well, that it may not always be viewed as a kind of good place for some of those kind of artistically creative people yes people that are creative with their hands will naturally gravitate to it but more creative thinkers i mean what we ended up doing is actually setting up um a separate innovation team um where you're kind of recruiting people that have got a bit whack, wacky ideas and don't fit the, don't fit the usual mold and those people love working to that and that drives an engine there's so much innovation needed in this space and sometimes people with completely different skill sets and kind of think, ah, oh, we did that in like the aerospace industry or something. And that, that's pretty valuable. I know people like to be in that, that space and the creativity. I think that's probably something that's missed out that some of those people don't even think about this sort of industry. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, there's, there's, it's the creativity, there's things you can bring in. The other thing about competency is competency can be shared from transferable skills. Com you, you, set, you have a set of competencies for whatever your time to deliver. Um, if you talk to people and start, if you interview and do the correct, ask your questions correctly, look for specifics, then people, you will find a skill set that they might not even realize is there. Because when you ask them for examples, people will start to live, oh, well, I've not done exactly that, but I've done this, this, and this. And you'll find their competencies. And as Tristan says, you can build that into a job and you can build that into a role for somebody and develop a role around somebody. Or alternatively, you might find that their competencies fit exactly with what you're looking for for a specific role anyway. Um, but if you don't, it's all about asking the right questions. And, Attitude over competencies is always going to be um, more important because somebody's desire and want to build within a business is always going to be incredibly important. But competencies themselves, you 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 will pick up people's skill sets and just asking questions around them anyway, and and that's how you, you you grow your teams with the right people in the right place. So how can companies ensure that their employees are staying up to date with their, the latest employee needs, skills, and technologies? For example, Tristan. Um, Horizon scanning is an interesting one um, in terms of it's, it's worth people sort of just, just looking around and subscribing to one or two or three sort of different things. You've got that kind of feed of things coming through. So easy for sort of things to be happening and keep not keep in touch with that stuff. So keeping aware of that and attending sort of things like exhibitions once in, once in a while um, helps keep you a bit, bit interested and a bit abreast of what's, what's going on. That was one thing that came to mind. Um, in terms of technologies, um, personally, kind of having that IT in-house and just having that supportive thing and a team that's actually encouraging adopting of try, trying different apps. Some people will actually take to it like a duck to water with new apps. Many of us, and perhaps especially in this industry, can be a bit archaic and do it the way we've always done it. Um, so it does need 
in, encouraging and availability of being there to fix their problems gives them a bit more confidence to try try new things. Um, and a really simple one: everyone's got everyone's got a smartphone, wherever they are, pretty much. And an app that we find is incredibly powerful for any of this stuff is Slido. Um, don't need any app installed or whatever. You can just go straight onto your browser and you can get a survey of lots of people. This comes back to the huddle, or if you've got an all hands session or a group session. Um, we haven't done it, but some people in the construction industry, and I've done this stuff in the evening. So people that are working with a hand during the day may log on for a few minutes in an evening session, listen to a thing in a chat forum. The things that's so powerful about that Slido thing is effectively you've got a room with how many people, 50 people, 100 people, and they're effectively all talking at once because they can be tapping in their questions um, and gathering that data and doing something about it afterwards. So I very much recommend that's been really part of getting our MPS score up. Everyone's got a voice um, without, <laughs> yeah, you can physically you couldn't do that with people in a room together, but you can do it with that and technology. The other thing you just touched on there is actually doing something about it afterwards. When you, when you get this data, you get people, you get the business and the team to feedback. It's then doing something about it, okay, within re being realistic, there's certain things you're, you're not gonna be able to do. Um, but it's actually turning around and going, look, we are delivering based on what you are. But that, again, back to that retention. And we're constantly for asking you questions because what, what, one thing comes up from somebody, you think that'd be interesting to know what other yeah. people thought of that. And quite live, some of this stuff, you, as soon as you've got it typed in your answer and do it, you can see what answers other yeah. people or questions or see those graphs there. Again, it's back to that anonymous, yeah. non-anonymous bit. Or in that case, you can't necessarily see who said what, but you can see what everyone else yeah. in the room is thinking. You're, you're highlighting again, you're, you're, and you're seeing, you'll see themes come through. You'll see things that the, the employment market and, and people within the business in this instance want. So, how do we retain them? This is what they want. Again, it's going back to that we're in a candidate market moment. How do we keep staff from a retention perspective? Is equally as important for the attraction? What do we need to be delivering? As I say, there's got to be some realism to it, and it's got to be a little bit realistic. But is there stuff we can do? For example, I, I've I've had a um, an industry a client in, in the industry actually now put fresh fruit in their office. It's really basic. It's costing them a tenner a week, but that's it was in the staff wanted fresh fruit. It, it, it's kept people happy as a result. It's, it's minimal, but it, it's done a job for them. So when we're talking about role of apprenticeships and other training programs and the roles that they play within the recruitment and retention of, within the construction industry, how do you feel that those roles are key, um, Andy? So I think it's, it's understanding young people is, is, is really important in this space. It's not just about young people. You know, our, apprentice, our average age of apprentice is actually 34, but, but understanding what they look for is really critical. So if you left school, pretty much since around about 2019 20 then your school teacher was telling you either go to a university or get an apprenticeship they were kind of the, the way that, that young people are pushed and because of the change that came about with the levy in 2017 you know apprenticeships are, go all the way up to, to level six level seven degree level apprenticeships post-grad level apprenticeships so young people are getting told either go to uni but you might get a bit of student debt or get yourself an apprenticeship and you can earn more you're what, what, what you're learning and as a sector, we just haven't really kind of got to grips with that yet because we're, we're still a little bit kind of reluctant to, to go heavyweight in, into apprenticeships. I think we had 22,000 apprentices um, enrolled within the sector last year, which is less than half of, of, of what we really need just to meet the, the, you know, the current needs of, of the people turn, turn over. So, so apprenticeships are actually critical for us. But if you're a young person, you're looking for a job that says apprenticeship on it. And actually, it's bloody hard. So, you know, I encourage you today to go and have a look in your, whatever your bit of industry is, and go and find a job as an apprenticeship in, in your bit of industry. And you'll find it really difficult to do that because there ain't many out there and it's really hard to get hold of them, especially in the town that you live in. So, so for me, that, that's kind of why apprenticeships become important. Under 25 year olds are looking for apprenticeships within construction and can't find them. Youth unemployment today sits at 10.8%. One in, one in 10 young people under the age of 25 can't find the job that they want. We have those needs. We, we know that we're going to have those future needs, and we need to be offering young people the opportunity to um, to come and join us. And, and you know, that to me is the is, is just a massive challenge for for all of us. And, and it, you know, one firm doesn't do it; don't fix it. Everybody's got to collaborate and be working on it together. That's the only way we're going to we're going to solve the needs we've got. And I'm really sorry because I probably didn't even answer the question, Nick, but because I can't quite remember what it was. But um, I went on my usual passionate plea about the sub war apprentices. So uh, I don't know if I answered it or not. Find that. That answers it perfectly, to be perfectly honest. 
Um, unfortunately, we are coming to the end of our time now. It's a shame because I, I feel this quite easily gone for another hour, but uh, we are coming to the end of the time. Um, so what I'm going to ask all of you now is just a quick takeaway that, that you'll take from today's panel. Alex, if you don't mind, can I start with you? I, th I think it's the, the, the big thing that Rosalind said is, is the language piece. Is are, are we doing that? We can advertise and we can talk and we can retain and we can do exactly what we want. But when, if we're not being inclusive with it and getting the right language right in the first place, we're banging our head against a brick wall because we're shutting out half the market. That, that's a big thing. That, that's for me is a big takeaway. Lovely. Tristan? Um, just, just what Andy said just then, um, I'll be one of the, the many in the industry that's probably a bit guilty of not really understanding the apprenticeships or not really advertising it. Um, we, I don't think we do really ha have enough apprent apprenticeships because yeah. it's just sort of, yeah, probably back to what you said at the beginning, that it's kind of viewed as a bit of hassle and paperwork and stuff. And is it really, is it really worth it for the saving? Yeah, you know, we recruit plenty of young people, but not really through an apprenticeship route. Right? So really like, definitely. Yeah. Need, need to know more about it, Andy. So perhaps that's the education piece. Give, give us a call anytime. <laughs> there is one thing I'll touch on that from what you were just saying there, Tristan. Although you don't necessarily have a named apprentice, I think what Sapphire do as a whole with bringing young people through and moulding them and training them to work in a certain way, I think is absolutely unique. There's, there's not many places that would take a, a school leaver who is completely untested within the market and actually bring them through and give them that trust in, in, in bring them on. And I think it's worked absolutely perfect for, for Sapphire, hasn't it? So our head of marketing, for example, Nick Gordon, he's been here for 16 years now and, and that was since he left school, so. Yeah, I was about to that point our attitude, yeah, more important than skill. Indeed. Than training. Yeah, yeah, definitely. What's well, then your takeaway from the day? A lot of things really and I think language is only one part of it because language reflects behaviours and attitudes so language is the outward of expression of our behaviours and attitudes so we we really need to challenge ourselves on that but we have so much to offer uh, really because when you think about it it's a career where you get opportunity so there's career opportunities there's good pay and rewards and benefits you get to leave a legacy behind you know uh, you get to contribute to the important matters in the in the world like um you know the environment and social matters you know these are really important themes for young people it's just it doesn't come across we we often talk about the nuts and bolts of things oh do you want to be a bricklayer and put one brick on the top of another why why don't we say would you like to build a fantastic building that would transform a community and would be really uh, environmentally efficient and uh, would you like to be a part of a, an inspiring team of people who are you know trying to to create something really uh, useful and comfortable and healthy for people. Um, we get things like Grenfell that keep reminding us where we are. We need we need to move forward. So I think another thing we should think of, let's take people from other professions. Let's take people from IT. Let's take people from, I don't know, business, law. Let's take people from all kinds of, go to universities and take people from other disciplines. They can they can diversify our in industry and they can they have so much to contribute to it as well so those are all my takeaways <laughs> one hour but quite a useful hour perfect and andy yourself yeah um so probably two big ones i i, I Rosam is absolutely right about language and I, I felt guilty when you were describing the language gets used because I, I do that all day long even though i work with lots and lots of young people so i think there's a big big take out from there um and, and I think the other bit that I get excited about with calls like this is, is this only works when we talk to each other and we collaborate and we work together. So, so for me, it's just, you know, the more talking we do, the more awake, you know, I've, I've learned stuff on the call and, 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 you know, the more we have calls, the more we learn stuff from each other, the more we can kind of think, well, actually, how do we solve those problems and how do we work together to solve those problems? I think that, you know, you know we're a big business. We've got 20,000 employees, but we can't, we can't handle this. You know, it's much, much bigger than Travis Perkins. It's much, much bigger than all of us, but together, we can we can make a massive difference and we need to because if not the skills price just gets tougher and tougher for all of us so you know for me it's about more of this more talking to each other more working together to solve the issues we've got and i always come back to that 
you know, at the moment, one in 10 young people under the age of 25 not in work, who want to work, who are actively looking for work, you know, surely we can do something with those people and surely we can offer them a route in that's going to give them, you know, a great future, but also helps us as a sector to have a, have a great future as well. Perfect. So just to touch on, on what you were saying there, Andy, you're right, talking talking can make a difference. And this is something that, that we pride ourselves on with Resi Build. That's Resi, R-E-S-I dot build for anyone that would like to log on, because we do have a few more events coming up where we will be talking about some important issues within the industry. One of which we, we touched on briefly earlier, competency. We have an event on the 15th of March between 12 and 1. Again, another virtual panel. Um, and we'd love everyone to, to log on and, and join us for that. Uh, we'll be discussing, and uh, th uh, that panel discussion will be aimed at decision makers across the entire residential construction industry. Um, so yeah, if, if that's something that'd be of interest for you, we'd love you to join us on that. But I'd just like to say thank you very much to all our esteemed panelists today for joining us and taking the time. I know there are a few technical issues and things like that, but thank you very much for, for joining us nonetheless. I think it's been very informal and I think everyone's enjoyed it and learned something from this today. So thank you all very much. Thank, thank you. you. Thanks everyone. Bye Cheers. Bye. Cheers. Thank Cheers. you. Bye-bye.